Well, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Megan Austin, and I am the director of the Montclair State University Galleries here in New Jersey. I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us from your respective locations um, for our first Artisan Conversation. This program is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Techno Future from Slang to Structure, curated by Tom Leeser who is the Director of Art and Technology Program and the Center of Integrated Media at CalArts. Um, a few thank yous uh, to get out of the way. First, Tom, for curating such a dynamic exhibition and pulling together this incredible group of artists for this show. And also for the artists, the 11 artists who contributed to uh, the work to this exhibition and started collaborating with us since the inception of this project uh, all the way back in 2019 before we went through so many changes that have greatly impacted us on personal levels, but also professional levels and this exhibition in general. I also want to thank um, Daniel Gerskis and the Dean's Office, uh, the Dean of the College of the Arts, uh, the McMullen Family Foundation, the Montclair State University faculty, staff and students for their support. Uh, as this exhibition has really started to bring the community together and I am starting to see the realization of a vision for integrating the visual arts into the academic and community experiences generated through the university galleries. So I thank, I thank you all for participating in this process. And um, just to give a, a little framework to the program today, um, this will last approximately an hour and then we'll open up the conversation in the last 15 minutes for a Q&A. Uh, with both our virtual and in-person attendees. We have people also sitting in the gallery right now who are also watching and they will be feeding uh, uh, questions to us as well. So without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce Charlotte Kent. Uh, Charlotte is the Assistant Professor of Visual Culture in the Department of, the Co of Art and Design at Montclair State University and also an arts writer. Uh, she contributed her essay, An Odd Assortment of Thoughts on the Monsters, Margins, and Media of Our Time to our Techno Future catalog. And she was also a fantastic editor of that catalog as well. And also Carla Guinness. Carla is a transmedia artist and educator based in Brooklyn, New York. And she produces works that consider the uncanny complications between grounded and virtual reality, nature and artifice, science and science fiction in contemporary culture. She is an industry professor at the Tandon School of Engineering, Department of Technology, Culture and Society in the Integrated Design and Media Program at NYU. And I think she just wanted to see if I could list all of those things successfully. And I think I have done it. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it off to, to Charlotte and to Carla as I know they are going to be dis uh, discussing many of the topics that are uh, um, addressed in the exhibition Techno Future, and 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 so I'll hand it off to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Megan, um, and thank you, Carla, so much for joining me in conversation this evening, um, and thanks to the audience for being with us wherever you are. Um, I know we've been doing lots of framing, so I'm just going to do a little bit more framing. I can't help it. Both Carla and I are. Um, teachers along with all the other things we do and so it's in our nature to want to sort of have some structure around what we think we're going to talk about because that way we can actually just totally deviate and who knows where this conversation will wind up going but with all the ideas that are present in the show and I think it, one of the really remarkable things from my perspective about working on the show and you know with the writers and you know being in conversation with the artists has been just how many ideas um, Tom was able to really sort of pull together through the different works that are on display. Um, and in the title, it says techno future, one of the things that sort of becomes apparent is this notion of time, right, and thinking about the future. But it's really easy these days to sort of get lost in thinking about the future and thinking about time as only being something we want to think about in terms of the future and not re remember of time as being this like long expanse and that we have different relationships to it, that it's duration, it's instant, it's imagined, it's embodied, it's uh, structured, it's technologized, um, it's global, it's specific. So. 
with all of these different sort of ideas floating around and given how much Carl and I have talked sometimes about influences and references, we sort of thought that we'd have our conversation today and start by talking about time with history, which would help us move into the present and through that get into the future and worlding and some of these other ideas. Um, but like I said, no promises. Um, so Carla, <laughs> um, I wanted us to get started. It seemed just so fitting to talk about uh, history and sort of notions of time by talking about this work that you contributed to this show. Um, Garden of Emoji Delights is, you know, displayed in the gallery. Thank you so much for the, uh, you know, install image here. It is one of your, you know, very well-known works. It has itself been viewed around the world. So it has traveled both in space and time. Um, and it's partly inspired by this 15th century artist, Hieronymus Bosch. And so I wanted to get us started just thinking about what led you to Bosch and here in the 21st century, thinking about and wanting to look at and enjoy making your own thing in relationship to this now 500 year old work? So this piece really began with a prompt. I had already started to incorporate the lexicon of emoji in my work, but sparingly. And IBEAM, which is a cultural arts center in New York, had an open call for works that are produced, art and design produced using emoji. And I wanted to kind of consider that and what I would, you know, respond to that call with. And so it really was a light bulb emoji moment <laughs> where I stayed up all night. Charlotte, we were talking about pulling all nighters. I pulled an all nighter and I did a sketch of the hell panel with emoji, you know, in reference to the Bosch. And at first I, you know, upon getting two hours of sleep, you know, and I'm reflecting on it. And I wasn't quite sure if, if I should even present this work, but I stuck to it. And as I thought about it, because that's something that happens for me, and it's something we've discussed quite often, Charlotte, is, is and it's part of my artistic practice is, you know, I do have those spontaneous moments. An idea just comes to me and I act on it. And then I consider it and then, start to engage in research or really reflecting on that impulse. And of course, I having two degrees in painting, having studied art history, it's a piece that's resonated with me for a long time. I'm a maximalist, my you know tendency as an artist. I also have uh, proto surrealist or surrealist kind of tendencies in my work and have for some time. And so there would be all sorts of reasons I'd be drawn to that work. But also, what upon reflection kind of dawned on me was that I had never seen the work other than as a reproduction. Mm. And I'd seen it as a reproduction, multiple color plates in books, but more recently I'd seen it on the internet, the same way I experienced the language of emoji. And so that's why I think I felt this compulsion to mash up these two, you know, sign systems and to see what happened in doing so. And it was really fascinating too, you know, this 500 year old work that as I started using emoji and at the time it was 2013, so it was a much more limited lexical set. But as I started using them, particularly for hell, I had so much fun, you know, um, because it produces this cognitive dissonance when you have these smiling characters, you know, placed in the pits of hell. But also quite a few of the symbols that Bosch were using, I, you know, I was finding a one-to-one -one relationship with, you know, our current um, kind of set of, you know, uh, internet semiotics, right? These, these cute characters that we use as shorthand expressions for all sorts of communication. And um, so that's, you know, kind of why I embarked on it and stuck with it for a year and a half of my life. Wow. Um, I think this is a really important point about the sort of way you dug into it and the way you started making these ones, you know, these finding one to one equivalencies. Um, and yet at the same time, I think one of the things that's interesting about your version of it is that it's not nostalgic. Right. I mean, one of the dangers of getting into the, these historicizing moments sometimes is that it's very easy, especially with the kind of catastrophe thinking that is a part of this era that we're living in and with people feeling really anxious about technology in particular, right, is to go into these catastrophic places. And yet 
Beca and, and then because of that, to become nostalgic of some imagined moment, right? Where things were better, life was not as complicated, people somehow had better lives that we just only wish we could have. This is, of course, there's problems with this way of thinking. And it's one of them because people are afraid of doing that. They often don't go to history because they don't want to bring history forward in a way that makes it seem like we're trying to recall it, right? So I'm wondering if, you know, this is just simply not a nostalgic piece at all. And obviously you weren't trying to make it be, but like, how did you find yourself navigating you know, this historical space so that it's not historical, so that it feels contemporary, so that it feels present tense. And were there things about Bosch in particular that made it possible to not fall, fall into nostalgia, to not fall into that kind of thinking? So great questions. What's really interesting about Bosch, and another reason I'll, I'll mention again, I only knew the work on the internet and it's as popular, I've been conducting something called a Google results project for about 10 years where I search these string queries and I will record the results. And so I started, you know, just trying to kind of take a, a, a measure of how popular Bosch was in relation to how popular Moji. And they both were equally resonant, you know, wow. amongst internet culture. And I was fascinated by that. And you can find all of these different products, even, you know, 2013, 2014. And so that was something that was really fascinating to me mm -hmm. is how much this work still resonates. And so, of course, I have studied art. I love art history. I am touched by these works. But also, I was more fascinated by how it was continuing to resonate. And one of those reasons is because I think it's enigmatic enough that we can project our own assumptions on it and start to kind of identify with it outside of history. Because actually Bosch was very serious. I, I mean, there's little known about him, but the various accounts I've read and historians who have really dug into trying to interpret the work and interpret his messages and his positionality, um, all tend to agree that he was fervent. He really, when he was painting hell, he believed that was hell. Now, for my position today in the 21st century as a technologist, as a person who um, doesn't really have a faith in that way, you know, I can project other things onto the painting and those aren't, you know, a nostalgic look. If anything, it's a kind of critical reinterpretation that is, not, you know, how could I be critical, particularly of Bosch within his time, but even the various interpretations, including um, a lot of crazy album cover art in the 70s, for example, you know, or the fact that Salvador Dali, when I finally did get to see the original painting, I do have to say I teared up in front of it. I also mm -hmm. had a hack the museum moment because I actually have augmented this work as well. And so I surreptitiously, because at the time in the Prado, this was the end of 2016, no photography was allowed and I pulled out my phone really fast and I have documentation of my augmented reality version, my 3D emoji version over the actual original painting. Oh. But um, but I did tear up, but I remember also the person who was, you know, our, our tour guide that day talking about how Salvador Dali, you know, went to see this piece while he was growing up, you know, like every day or every week and was drawing from it. And so it just has continued to resonate. Today, you can find Hieronymus Bosch on Doc Martens, for example. And so those were the things that I was really kind of curious and interested about as well, not just the kind of um, art historical reference, but also how it still registers in culture today. Because I do think a lot about language as well. And so how something like that and that particular visual language resonates in this, not in the same way, but resonates in terms of popularity equally to something like emoji. Right. And what happens when you fuse those two things together? I also think, I mean, I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about time, right? And so this, I've sort of had this project around time going on and I was realizing how one of the other things that's interesting about it, and I think that's one of the reasons why your version feels so 
real and like just very I understand even though you know even as like every time I look at it there's something new to me like I just understand this image is partly because there's so much about that work that is has a contemporaneous feel to it. We work with screens all the time. We have multiple screens in our lives, right? So in a way that was true, that has perhaps not been true before, like notion of the triptych, the notion of multiple images being there together at the same time is just so much a part of our visual culture now in a way that maybe was less true a hundred years ago, right? But the other part of it is, it's interesting to think that even though he was in the end of the 15th century, and died in 1519, right? Um, the notion of structured time was still really emerging. So the, one often blames the Benedictine monks for creating this really structured um, time because of the way they needed to schedule prayer. So time had been this much more sort of embodied and fluid thing, which is one of the reasons why even in artworks, we get this layering of time before you know, the early modern period with it being not at all incongruous to have biblical stories presented as being a part of the 14th century or, you know, with those costumes and those people because there was a slightly different relationship to time. And then this notion of clocks arising, bells arising, partly having to do with the monks needing to have this very strict schedule and that you start to get this notion of duration time and structured time and it being an external thing starting then. So he would have been an early part of that, but many towns still didn't have bells and it was still very much a, a much looser construct than would obviously develop then, especially with the industrial age and railroads and this sort of needing to have very clear delineated time. But one of the things that's interesting is that with digital time, we return to the instant. Because with digital time, you no longer get the visual experience of duration, right? The clock shifts from the sort of moving hand to being this like, oh, here's the time. Oh, look, at, there's the time again. Oh, it's, you know, it's always these instantaneous numbers as opposed to getting breadth. And yet for all that, you know, digital time and that instantaneity and the 24 seven anxiety becomes really problematic. It also layers time in a way that has for me certain types of sort of feeling affective qualities that are sort of like this other, you know, pre-duration time. Um, and so it's almost like it's appropriate that you'd get this kind of layering effect that is happening here. Um, so I wanted to say all that, but I, at the same time, am always cautious because you always remind me of being careful of false equivalencies. Right. And I know that this is something that's been really important to you because you are someone who looks into the history and thinks about historical in relationship to your practice. So can you tell us a little bit about how false equivalencies are something you 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 work against? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people assume based on the kind of appropriation I do in my work or remix that in referencing many artists from the canon, and if I'm referencing historical artists from the canon, that means I'm referencing men, <laughs> that these are all my favorite artists in the world. But I, again, as I've mentioned, have high regard for, you know, so many works from throughout history, and they have influenced my practice throughout my career. But there is also a bit of a critique there, because, you know, only one sector of the population represented and got to tell the stories for hundreds of years. And as a female identified artist working today, part of this has been um, a way of kind of commenting on after, you know, hundreds of years of seeing of myself as, you know, uh, someone who is female represented as the object getting to think about the subjects and the subjects I take on and the authorship that I would start to claim, right? And so I think automatically, if I take that position, I'm going to be looking through a different lens at this. And I'm not going to also, none of us can help but to kind of project on to historical objects and kind of position them in the frameworks of what reality is to us today. But I, was upon doing more research, upon just spending a year of my life 
digitally producing this and kind of inhabiting Bosch's brain, so to speak, and trying to figure out what he could have been thinking, but recognizing that there was no way I'd ever have full access to that. And that's why I had to kind of make it my own. And that's why it, I'm kind of reauthoring it. And that became important to the process. One other thing, oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. One more thing. Oh, one other it. thing, you know, just visually, you know, the triptych or predellas, you know, these are pre comic strips, pre storyboards or movies, but they have been really kind of important to me throughout my um, career. Again, I've, I've done a series of works with predellas and other works with triptychs as well. And I do like that kind of representation of time and how you can sometimes subvert it too. And even the Bosch, it, it reads like a scroll, it reads like you could be scrolling down it, you know, the way that we scroll today with our phones and um, just spatially the way it's kind of organized. And so that was something that was just visually compelling to me and something that I connected with as well. And this idea that, you know, um, pre-conventions of storytelling that we use through film and that the way we mock it up is through, you know, um, either graphic novels, of course, but also storyboarding, those kind of things. Prior to that, and you were talking about time, this was their way of take, you know, of kind of depicting um, some kind of linear narrative. But Bosch's was really interesting because at the same time as it's supposed to represent some kind of lin linearity, what there's a lot of enigma to that as well. And I respond to, you know, that kind of confusion. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, you know, just since you were talking about the canonical artists and that being this particular subject who got mm -hmm. to tell the story, um, of course, the stereotype around technology is very similar. And so I'm just wondering if you would, you know, speak a little bit about what it means, given that you have this sort of feminist lens that you bring to the art that you do, um, what it means to also be occupying a, um, whether actually or merely depicted as such, largely male dominated space of being integrated into technology, both you know professionally as an artist, but also in your teaching and having left art for this other largely seeming to be whether right or wrong, because there's you know lots of errors around this, but like white male dominated space. So how do you navigate that immersion and bring a feminist lens to that part of the practice? I love this question. And I have been working with technology for well over 20 years, actually going on about 24, 25. And even prior to that, uh, a bit about my background, and probably another reason I am drawn to kind of historical artifacts is I studied painting from a young age. I also studied classical piano to point that I was teaching it when I was in high school. But my dad took me to my first computer graphics conference when I was 15. And he was self-taught, but he just, you know, he dove in. And I remember at the time I kind of balked at this. And my dad said, Carla, this is the future of art. One day you won't think of this just as commercial graphics. This will, art will be made with computers. But, and this is an interesting in terms of time, this was a reverse generation gap. My dad was way cooler than I was. And I, you know, like, I still want to apply pigment on a substrate the way people have done it, the way the guys have done it for 500 years, you know. And I want to play my Bach and Mozart, et cetera. But I moved to New York in 1995 and I had an epiphany that I actually, you know, was ready to dive in, that I had listened to my dad more than I admitted. <laughs> and I was done with rebelling against my dad and, you know, going that direction. And also, I think I changed my sense, even though it's taken a couple decades for a lot of people to catch up with me in terms of thinking that I was leaving art. I wasn't leaving art by throwing away my paintings or putting away my paintbrushes. I never thought that this pivot or this transition meant that I was leaving art. It just meant I was embracing art in what the dawning 21st century. And I remember I used to say, Leonardo, Michelangelo, they would have been working with digital technologies mm -hmm. for sure. I just imagine polymaths would have, you know? And so 
I remember at times having to defend it as an art form early on and particularly in a male dominated culture because to support myself, one thing I did leave was kind of the art employment. I had been assisting artists and I realized, oh, I have this tool set now. Why don't I, you know, actually um, look for work where, you know, I could actually make a salary and, and, and you know, kind of uh, actually pay my rent. And, and that was something going to a painting school where quite a few, you know, colleagues or, or peers felt that I was selling out. And again, you know, that is industry and working in the industry particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was where I really had to face a male-dominated culture, assumptions that I just wasn't going to be good at these things, that, you know, questioning at every step of the way, like how I got to, you know, because I was working in design a lot of times, particularly back then, it was problem solving and how I solved a problem, checking my code, these kind of things. And I have to say, that was very frustrating. And, you can develop either an imposter syndrome or you just have to kind of, you know, develop a stronger backbone and believe in yourself. And I have to say, I am constantly, even today, you know, sometimes negotiating between imposter syndrome and then just thinking, wow, I am kick ass, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, within the industry, that was definitely an issue. And I, to compare now to then, it seems like things have gotten better in terms of representation in the industry. For example, I teach in an engineering school with my you know, two degrees in painting. I teach in an engineering school. I teach in a program that is an art and design program. But within that, we have our first dean who is female. And in terms of um, our faculty, we actually, there are more women faculty teaching in my particular program in this engineering school than men, and likewise in terms of um, student populations. So all of that really is exciting and, and seems to me to provide promise, but the one thing that we still find, and then I'm going to pivot back to art after I finish talking about industry, because now <laughs> what we see and I'm only going to broach this with NFTs, this, you know, kind of industry and art are colliding in ways that they haven't in the past. But um, what I wanted to say in terms of industry, I'm hopeful, but still there are these ceilings, because when we look at the, you know, top four billionaires who are working in industry and in, you know, tech and entrepreneurship, they're all white men. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, that said, in terms of art, the resistance wasn't just in art in general, in 2006, I curated a show where I invited five female artists to co-curate with me, and we called it Multiple Partners. And it was actually in response to a Jerry Salt article where he talked about that representation of male artists still predominated museums. And so it was kind of like this ceiling that we see in the tech industry and in the art world where women can get to a certain point, but then they can't go higher, right? and they're not in the you know, major museum retrospectives or their work isn't selling as much on the market. Those kind of things still exist today. But in 2006, when I curated this show, I invited all these women to actually invite more men to participate in the show with them to reflect the percentages of men to the male to female relation, uh, the male to female ratio in the art world. But for women to be, making the decisions of where their work fit in and to have that agency to say come dance with me and my work actually fits into you know this whatever because as we know there are all sorts of different kind of art worlds and different uh kind of trends in the art uh market and so for them to actually get to have that agency and empowerment to choose where their work would be placed and to put it amongst a male dominated field Totally. I mean, I think this is such a great way to talk about some recent work you've done, because I think one of the things that technology, you know, all art can do is help us sort of shift some of our perspectives on these things. Um, obviously, in the show Techno Futures itself, it's predominantly women. And I think this is a really interesting thing, because I do feel like we're seeing, um, you know, the works of a lot of women these days. And um, 
I'm certainly grateful for that. I think it adds, you know, an important perspective to the use of technology, to the types of foundations that have become really important in terms of, you know, what can come next and what types of futures we imagine. But before I get into future, I want to take a moment on present tense because I think, you know, you you ha you have used technology to highlight certain types of feminist issues and to bring forth you know issues around visuality and gaze and i can't help but think of peep box which is this work you just did this last spring partly in the context of um the sort of blockchain uh moment that we've all been in. But I wanted to highlight it for a second because it allows us to talk about many different things in your practice. But what was so interesting to me about that piece was, again, it was historical, right? There you went back into like doing all your research. Um, how you have time for it, I really don't know. But that part of the impulse of the piece was that you couldn't see it, right? Um, and that this notion of you know, giving agency and who gets to have agency to see things. Um, so just because that's such a present tense issue right now of like who gets to see and who gets to decide who gets seen, right? I'm wondering if you would just talk about what, what about our current technology moment or maybe the work that you had just recently been doing led you to make this kind of inverted choice of making a work that in theory people couldn't see inside? So when I first embarked on that, uh, one, I had a dream. And so this is something else. A lot of times I talk about my research, I talk about my practice, I talk about all of the different technologies I use because I am a big computer nerd and I'm at my computer a lot. But I also respond again to you know all sorts of other phenomena so i had a dream where i was a you know peep box and i couldn't get out and i woke up that morning and and it was because i you know at the time i was i was trying to think about what i was going to produce again it was a kind of prompt to you know i was invited to be in this show and it was right at the kind of emergence of course blockchain has been around for quite some time but the emergence of a lot of attention being paid to nfts and and there was also a as there still is a lot of contention Right. And so I, I just kept pondering, what am I going to make? What am I going to make? And then I had this dream. And then I remembered, you know, uh, 15 years ago and actually 15 to 18 years ago, I used to make peep boxes. I used to insert them into walls. And I thought, well, I'll revisit that. But what would it be like to revisit it in this context and to revisit it not as a physical construction, as something tangible? I had made in the past, but as this virtual object, this virtual piece of sculpture, but also added to that mix was the complaint about NFTs that one buys this contract and oftentimes the art object itself is either, you know, referenced in the metadata, but it's off chain, right? Mm -hmm. And so the art object, particularly if it's a digital art object, and digital artists have been having to defend their practice and the validity of it as art for you know several decades now. But the assumption is, well, I can just download the JPEG. Why would I want to buy an NFT? Because there, it's accessible. It's on the internet to me. And it's something I've dealt with, even with the Garden of Emoji Delights. And, and one way I often kind of straddle this in terms of making my work accessible and straddling ubiquity and scarcity is having something that's low resolution that is you know on the internet and it travels and it has the speed you know, of motion that becomes so important to art on the internet and then scarcity i have super high resolution this is a 13 foot by seven foot like multi gigabyte file you know and um and so that's the way that I have kind of explained those differences, you know, uh, between, you know, the scarce model that I work with and the ubiquitous model I work with as a digital artist and also having been a net artist. Now, getting back to the point, though. Sorry, Charlotte, you know what I can do. You're good. This. You're good. <laughs> um, so, so I was really thinking about that complaint. Well, if you can just download the JPEG, why would you want to invest in the work? And I, and I felt that that was... Um, really kind of undermining, you know, this whole movement and, and also that, you know, more attention was finally being paid to digital artists and their practices. But I thought it would just be kind of funny, you know, to occlude the view. So 
I basically set up a contract. You have to believe there's something inside. And I built a, a 3D, so a, a virtual sculpture. And it's actually, again, there's a historical reference. It's the 17th century Baroque artist, Von Hoogstraten. And he made one of these uh, perspective boxes. And so I modeled mine much after his, although mine looks more like an Apple product. And it's trained on AI. And we'll get to kind of uh, also some feminist issues that I uh, do address in this work. However, I just, you know, was thinking about that and, and I was like, well, this is going to become a contract. We're talking about contracts now, and this is a contract of trust. I mean, there are also, you know, coming out of conceptual art, there have been and there is a lineage of artists playing in this way, you know, and, and even, you know, in terms of canning things and various things where you have to kind of have faith that what they're presenting is you know, real. I mean, starting with Duchamp, where he kind of confounds our expectation of what art itself can be. So all of that was just, you know, my having a little fun with this complaint. And so I was surprised and, and happily surprised that quite a few people decided to take that leap of faith with me and they invested in the object. And upon investing in the object, they're then sent to a site where they actually can peep into the box. They can be the voyeur, which we all are on the internet. But in addition to that, they are then provided with a VR experience where they find themselves inside of the peep box. And then one may assume that I'm, questioning, well, what about the fact that we are constantly surveilled? So as much as we are peeping, which there's a whole history of that, we also are being peeped at all the time, our data, you know, and, and even, you know, the, the issue of putting tape over your webcam, those kind of things. And so in building this VR experience, I then flip the script and you actually become, you know, um, a resident inside the peep box. And I even have two peepholes with eyeballs looking in at you to kind of, you know, uh, to hone in on that point. It's, I'm really glad you brought up because I mean, it's, it's so interesting to think about, you know, historically people have felt like they were so identified with a particular medium, right? But one of the things that's happened um, very, you know, recently in contemporary art in general is this idea of the post medium. People are not having to be tied to a particular medium, right? It's, you can produce this huge, you know, JPEG file and then you can animate it and then you're working in VR, but you're also, you know, producing this, you know, 3D rendered image that is part of what was initially sold. And then you have already mentioned AR, that you've done this AR thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that you can be moving across these different practices actually right because they call upon different parts of you know creative thinking um i will you... inter I'll, I'll interject really quickly here from my classical piano background okay. and that i used to compose things for me it's like theme and variations so i would transpose into different keys when mm -hmm. i put together you know um little you know uh, groups of artists playing a piece or something like that. And so I transpose into different keys for different instruments. And so for me, I think of my practice and I've been, you know, for 20 years, I've been generally coming up with a theme and then the variations are across media platforms now. And right. that seems really natural to me. Okay, yeah. but back to your question. No, but I think, I mean, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. And I, I really appreciate this language of theme and variation, because I think so often we think of these types of projects as being in terms of iteration, right? Iteration mm -hmm. is the language that gets used around technology so yeah. much. But of course, iteration, you know, one of the challenges with it is that historically, so much of the tech industry has used artists basically as beta tasters to then iterate for a larger commercial audience. And so there's, I'm, I'm, I'll admit that like, just as someone, I'm not an artist, right? Like I, I look at art, I talk to you guys, I get to write about it occasionally, but I mean, I'm always slightly uncomfortable when people talk about, you know, how they iterate in their practice because that feels like it winds up reiterating <laughs> this, this type of relationship that I think is really complicated in the history and complicated for what it means to be a present tense artist using these technologies and using some of these programs, these softwares, even these hardwares, right, mm -hmm. that have complicated lineages and complicated politics, right? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I just, I want to, you know, I, I wanted to di dive more into this for a moment, but I just, I guess I want to say one of the things that I appreciate about this idea of theme and variation that maybe is appropriate to this moment that we're living through and, you know, to get us into thinking about the future is that it really sort of, it allows us to world build in many different ways, right? Um, it's not like you made one peep box, right? Like this sort of like, it's this peep box that is this outside, but then it's also, you get to look in, but then it's also this VR experience, right? And so we and even have it. <laughs> yeah, right. And so this idea of what I think art has often allowed us to do, which is to think of the world not as being a fixed designated, I'm using that word because of its root in design, right, of this mm -hmm. designated space, but of being something that is potential, like it's potential energy as opposed to um, being determined. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, when you're making work, how do you, where, how do you make it possible for your audiences to f not feel like they are being given a message, but that they can inhabit these spaces or explore, you know, Wunderkammer, which is these like multiple, multiple VR chambers and multiple spaces, right? To feel like they can inhabit them, explore them, create them in that process. That's a good question. I think sometimes when I talk about my work, I can err on the side of didacticism. <laughs> Because I get so excited, I want to make sure that when I'm describing something that no one misses a thought that, you know, took place while I was producing this work. But when I'm producing the work, I will do lots of research. And again, I've been a designer. I also understand design practices, but I really allow for happy accident in the studio. And especially because it's very important to me that as I'm working with the technologies and most oftentimes I do have assistants work with me and I and I you know want to make sure I give credit to the fact that there are people who assist me but I generally am also touching everything I'm I know all the technologies I'm using it's not something I farm out and and there are many different approaches so you know that that's no judgment call it's just I like to actually that the process is is really fun to me and in that process I allow for accidents to happen I think sometimes Oh, yeah. Can, yeah. can I just pause for a moment? I think it's very challenging for many people to realize that accidents are possible when you're yeah. dealing with art that is using a computer because we so many, I think, experience computers as being fixed entities that produce set things. So can you talk, can you just briefly before you continue your thought, tell us about how you experience, like how you have accidents happen? So one way I have started to kind of help generate accidents. Mm -hmm. And so this was something I wanted to broach in terms of the peep box or the title for it is peep -rama. It's kind of cheeky. It's based on <laughs> Times Square peep shows from the 20th century primarily. But um, I have started working with an AI platform over the past year and a half. Yeah. Um, generative art, there's an entire history of that, but the generative nature of AI, it really kind of also changes my relationship to the technologies that I'm working with and the terms that I'm now consciously aware that my, my tools are learning from me and mm -hmm. that this becomes more of a collaboration. And so what happens with that in terms of kind of programming in accident in a way is I choose data sets or image sets, right, which are data sets, and then I feed them in, you know, to this, this uh, platform and let them bake. And then, of course, like a photographer, like, you know, people who have worked with processes, mechanical processes in the past, I then curate, I select. So it's still my artist's eye, it's still my judgment in selecting from thousands of images that have been generated, but also through that process of, you know, actually this feedback and response loop, 
I kind of have opened up to things where I might resolve something visually in a very specific way. But then when I go through this training process and new images are generated in response to my research and response to images that reflect that, I'm opened up to new possibilities. So that's one possibility for accident. And that one is, it's pretty self-conscious though, right? So that's, maybe that's more, again, um, just kind of generative. But then accidents can occur because I do long stints at the computer where I'm just starting to layer things. And had any of you seen my paintings? When I was a painter, you could pick up, I remember somebody talking about a Rembrandt and that you could pick it up by its nose. It had so much thick paint. Well, I was very influenced like Bay Area, figurative painters, all these painters with thick, dense, you know, texture to their paints. And for me though, it was more an issue with, I couldn't resolve and make up my mind on things, mind about things. And so I would have densely layered paintings, like, you know, just so thick. And it was because I just repaint and repaint and repaint. And so when I found di digital applications, it opened up a world to me for world building, but also for layering and for taking away and putting back in and taking away without the same way as scraping a canvas where you get a uh, Pentimento, you get a different kind, like there's a residue. And with the digital, you can choose to kind of have those artifacts or residue or, you know, glitch that is the nature of the medium. But you also can just kind of just like acetate, you can take a layer away and put it back. And so often for me, I, I work with a very layered process. Again, I am a maximalist. Uh, or I'll say a horror vacuist. Has anybody used that? I'm a horror vacuist. Um, I like that that term better. Um, and so, you know, I put everything but the kitchen sink in. And so often, even if it doesn't seem apparent, I actually am taking things away. And through that, I'll discover something where I, you know, might have had a certain intention to what I wanted to say or produce or share as an experience. And then I take one of those layers away and it opens up a new possibility. Okay. And then I decide to go with that. Oh. Um, oh. See, I still have so many more questions oh, for boy. you. We didn't even but, get to future. <laughs> I know. Well, I guess this is the future, right? Now, now it will right. happen. We will, look, we will look forward to the questions that we will be presented with. Yes. I hate to interrupt, but I actually think this would be a perfect time to field a few of the questions that have come up during sure. the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, that there was a question about your materials and the media and why you decided to choose digital technology and emojis over traditional media, uh, a traditional medium. So I think you sort of already answered that in a way, but I wondered if you could kind of expand on your um, your editing process in, in terms of all of these ideas, because it does seem like, you know, if you are working within a fixed medium of maybe painting, right, you have a canvas and that's the space you get to use and the digital is, is so endless. So how do you um, sort of self edit in your process? And I think this also could be a, a question for Charlotte as well, because she was the editor of our catalog, which have also <laughs> could have been endless. But these projects, and I think as creatives, they're, um, without the sort of structure of maybe a deadline of an exhibition, how do you go through the process of editing and, and, um, and shaping and giving um, a definition to your work? Are you ever not up against a deadline for an exhibition, Carla? <laughs> well, I've been having a lot of fun with a recent project and it isn't, well, no, it actually, some of that work now has been included in an exhibition. I was about to say this one project where I'm doing uh, these volumetric scans really started without any deadline or any prompt. And so I've really enjoyed the latitude of that. But to answer that question, Megan, um, in terms of how I kind of select or edit or frame the work. Um, in the Wonder Camera, or I should say Wonder Camera, but as an American, Wonder Camera, and it is spelled WWW Under Camera, highlighting that this is an archive of the internet and related to the internet age. But in that project, I don't think I'm editing so much. It has become this rhizomatic, multi-tentative beast. And I'm really enjoying and appreciating letting myself just explode in that way. But in other projects, it does become really important because 
I do think art is about communication. And sometimes in my studio, I can be very self-indulgent. And I can also kind of make assumptions about other people, you know, kind of keying into very intentional things that I'm adding to the work. And then I have to kind of step back. And I do, I stand at my computer, I step back. Sometimes I'll adjust my monitor or flip something. Like really, whatever I can do to kind of put me in a different frame of mind or looking at it from a different perspective and then start to make choices there about, okay, what assumptions am I making about the person who will be viewing or interacting or experiencing this work? And oftentimes that means I will actually talk to someone. I'll ask for someone else's opinion. I think that's really important too, getting feedback on your work because it's so easy to become precious with it. And particularly if you are a person who layers a lot like I do, um, it can be difficult to extricate things or take things away. And so then when I get critical feedback, I reconsider. And so that becomes important to the process as well. I mean, I was just gonna say, if I can just add one thing to it, because um, I mean, this was true in the editing process for the catalog, but I think it's also true for artists, you know, different pieces require different kinds of editing. So, I mean, in the catalog, the essays were very, very different approaches to thinking about this topic and how I talked to the different writers about it was very, very different. And what kind of editing mindset I brought to each of those pieces was very different because you have to respect what the work itself is producing. And I think that that's, I mean, I, I'm, we've talked about this, Carla, but I think that's also true for you. I mean, different projects and different pieces of art require a different kind of editing attitude. Yeah, for sure. Great, thank you. Um, we had another question come in for Carla. Um, how do you keep challenging yourself as an artist? That's another really great question. So I think implicit to the tools that I'm using I am always facing challenges. I think most artists working with digital technologies face the challenge that every few months your tools change or evolve and you have to be incredibly elastic. <laughs> That's the way I like to describe it. I'm like a rubber band and very elastic. And in terms of when I made paintings, I always knew that I had a substrate, I had a way of stretching a canvas, I had a way of mixing my paints, the tubes and the paints were not going to change, you know, radically within a few months or a few years or perhaps throughout my life. And when I began working with digital technologies, I recognized soon due to some issues that Charlotte talked about issues, you know, political issues in terms of planned obsolescence so that we can keep feeding the capitalist beast, you know, more products, more cons consumption. Um, I have a lot of old computers where I maintain older versions of software just so that I can access older works and I keep them off the internet so that the programs don't break. There are still all sorts of challenges and there are people like Regina Persani, who is um, an archivist or actually she wouldn't call herself an archivist, uh, a time-based media specialist who is working in digital preservation. And these points are really crucial. So I, I kind of have segued. So back to the question, stay focused. Uh, the question was, you know, how do I stay challenged or, you know, one way I stay challenged is that new technologies are coming out and I'm thinking about, do I have ideas through which, you know, I want to use this technology to express that idea, asking myself the question, well, I know I can make it. I'm, I'm pretty savvy with working with all these tools, but should it exist? Those kind of questions I think are really important to me. And then also, yeah, just the challenges any digital artist faces with having to constantly be adaptive. And, and, and that you're constantly learning something new. And sometimes you have to put the brakes on. You know, the other seduction can be, oh my gosh, there's this cool new thing. Okay, I've got to make something to, you know, show off that I know how to do this cool new thing. Do I really need to use that cool new thing? Or is there a process that I've already spent extensive time developing that I can stick with and keep working with that? 
Okay. If I can just, if I can just add there, I mean, I think this is a really important point about the politics around art and technology, which is there's a lot in the culture that encourages audiences to always try and get the new and to explore the new and to somehow you are a better person if you're using a newer technology. And I think one of the things that's interesting to me about um, some of the digital artists that I, like Carla, that I really enjoy, whose work I enjoy seeing and talking to and so forth is that there's a there's a consciousness around presenting not only the resistance to that but also the thoughtful engagement with the technology in other words yes it's okay you can use a new technology the, that using a new technology is not an inherently bad thing the way sometimes the discourse can go into this kind of like oh bad because of the capitalist beast and so forth but if you're going to think about it and engage with it thoughtfully and what does that look like to engage with it thoughtfully well actually artists are some of our best examples of how to do that because they have to be with the technology like all night long, right? Yeah, the critique from within, you know, um, there are all sorts of subversive ways <laughs> of kind of approaching working with these technologies. Uh, we actually have a question for Charlotte um, about the catalog. Uh, so you wrote sort of a creative nonfiction piece. Can you describe your writing process and did you have uh, the quotes ready to go. Um, yes and no. So this is a little more of that sort of happy accident type of thing. Um, I mean, basically, I had some research that I was doing around um, contemporary art and speculative design that in my case had to do with the absurd and like why I kept seeing a lot of contemporary artists working in these sort of absurdist ways and Carla was obviously a part of that she and I have had long conversations about this both as humans and on zoom and by phone and as avatars so we've really covered the gamut um, but as a part of that I was thinking about media and I wound up sort of thinking about tricksters and this kind of what it is to be neither here nor there, but to be kind of liminal and to be moving around. And when this show came up and I was talking to Tom, I thought it would be a nice opportunity to be liminal myself, right? So I've been doing this long scholarly project around thinking about the absurd and thinking about media and thinking about surveillance and technology and art and the rest of it. And I, I have articles with like, you know, very, very long citational practices and lots of footnotes. So everybody knows I really did my research and so forth. And I thought, you know, I'd love to be able to share some of that thinking, but in a way that doesn't make people feel like they have to sit down and turn on the light and drink a cup of coffee, right? Um, and so there were some definitely some quotes that had been a part of this that I just kept coming back to. So those were an initiating part of it. But then as I was writing this piece, of course, it took on kind of a life of its own and it started taking me in its own direction. And so I found myself wanting to do more reading and thinking some more about it. And then I realized um, I wanted to talk about even how communicating changes, which is why about three quarters of the way through the essay, I have this funny little character that I inserted in there using, you know, the keyboard, right? Like dashes and so forth and so how you could do that and that that is actually the where our emojis then come from right these sort of pictorial versions of it um to speak to the fact that i also just want to mention the way artists themselves are not only users of technology but in their use of technology present ways of thinking that then become adopted by scholars by technologists, by philosophers that become systems of thinking that then wind up themselves influencing things like urban design and psychology and all kinds of other things, right? So um, the last part of the essay is very much this sort of moment of like thinking about how the use of the uh, photo camera and the use of the film camera wound up producing ways of thinking that influenced um, theorists that then themselves influenced uh, 
basically what becomes, you know, a way of thinking about cybernetics, which then becomes really the way in which so much of our contemporary world is designed. And that wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been with the artist walking around with cameras, shooting pictures and making films. And that that's one of the things we often forget. We sometimes act as if artists are pure representationalists and actually they are also presentationalists. So I felt like creatively that was, I could do that better creatively than I could do by being like long-winded the way I am right now. <laughs> um, so I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. I just took down presentationists. I love that. <laughs> I was muted, but I was just kind of raw in the background. Presentationists, that's that's it. I mean, we didn't get to talk about world building, but you know, that's something else. Even through the framing with photography now, um, with digital technologies and these, these virtual spaces that artists are building, it's not about just representation. It's about imagining. And sometimes the world building is about not thinking outside of all of our assumptions about what is reality when you know a lot of reality is something that is either legislated or you know kind of agreed upon and thinking outside of also like well the future has to be this because this is how it's always been i mean artists like present and like they're presentationists they're presenting new perspectives and possibilities that then seep out into culture through art and letters and philosophy and engineering, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, I really want to thank you both for this incredible conversation and to create a, yet again, another extension of this exhibition, both in the virtual and the physical spaces. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time. Um, for those of you who are in person or are watching right now, uh, we do have another event coming up on December 8th. I will be giving a tour of the current exhibition um, and it will be on view until December 11th before we sort of all sign off for the holidays. So please uh, make a point to come uh, view the exhibition. It's both at the Siegel Gallery space and also extends beyond in the Castor Theater lobby and also over into um, the the uh, alumni green in front of Cole Hall, where you'll see a Nancy Baker Cahill augmented reality piece. So um, again, thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Carla. I really appreciate your time and thank you for sharing all of your insights. Thank you so much, Megan. Good night, thank everyone. You, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Ciao.